Hey guys, welcome back to the Cover 3 College Football Podcast. This is another one of our Around the Clock series with the experts from 24-7 Sports. And today I'm, I'm excited to bring on my friend Steve Bartle of UteZone.com. Tons of experience covering Utah, one of the most consistent programs in college football. Steve, welcome to the show. Bud, man, this is exciting for me. I, uh, longtime listener to the Cover 3 Podcast. You know, I was sad when when Shannon moved on from, from the show, but uh, but man, this is this is a big time deal for me. We've been following you, but I've got a group of friends. We've been following you for a long, long time. So I'm excited to be here. Oh man, you're making make, make me blush to, to open up the show. Uh, so as as you know, you're a listener to the show. So we we usually put 15 minutes on the clock. I'll hit you with some expectations, maybe some questions about last year, and we'll just kind of go through this thing and, and have some fun with it. Yeah, sounds good, man. Let's let's get to this. All right, Steve Barlow, youtube.com. 15 minutes are on the clock now so utah one of these pac-12 teams i feel like i need to always kind of start there they didn't start their season until november 21st which is probably the weirdest college football season any of us have ever covered uh steve just off the jump what, what do you make of last year and last year was was obviously difficult for a variety of reasons and i think utah really had a difficult start to say the least uh, in terms of, you know, obviously the Pac-12 with everything and the fiasco of canceling the season, bringing it back, when does it start, all of that. So just from that, you're starting behind the eight ball and, and the Pac-12 obviously didn't get the same start time that the Big Ten did. So they're, you know, even further behind than Big Ten. But Utah, you know, to start the season had some COVID protocol issues where, uh, they ha- they were forced to to miss the first two weeks, and so like you said, they didn't start till late November, and uh, you know that was that was a tough test. And in that opening game against USC, uh, there was a, a quarterback battle all fall camp between Jake Bentley, who was a transfer from South Carolina, and Cameron Rising, who previously transferred to Utah from Texas, and Cameron Rising emerged as the starter. And, you know, there was a lot of confidence and optimism in his, not only just him securing the job, but in his ability to kind of assume the role for, you know, a few years now. Uh, and and that was kind of his thing was taking over the reins and being a starter, a multi-year starter. However, like he gets hit, he gets hurt within, I think it was, I think it was like the 16th offensive snap for Utah in that game. And, um, and that, that was a, a devastating injury for, for a variety of reasons. Jake Bentley takes over as the starter. And, you know, just just with, with everything, with the lack of time and on, on the field, on the practice field, the lack of reps that you typically get in an offseason, which are so important for those transfers, and especially the quarterbacks to not only, you know, get a, a feel for the playbook and where reads are going to be, but to develop that chemistry. There was a lot of time that was lost. And so Jake Bentley just kind of started again, like behind the eight ball. That's kind of the story of, of Utah's opening 2020 season. They got things going. They found a running back and Ty Jordan, who turned out to be just an incredible talent. Uh, and Utah, you know, relied on him heavily uh, throughout the rest of the season. Their defense really kind of surprised people. Uh, it, it, there was uh, an expectation that they were going to take a big step back, but that defense just continued to, you know, be the, the strong suit of this Utah program. And, you know, they finished the year three and two uh, and uh, you know, so overall just kind of a, a, a big, it was a difficult season, but I think Utah learned a lot about themselves in terms of, you know, their strengths, their weaknesses, how to address them. And I think you're, I think this season will be very interesting uh, to, to kind of show us what Utah learned about themselves last year. So I'm, I'm going to throw some stuff at you just to off the jump, see if it feels right. Vegas right now has Utah at eight and a half regular season wins. So basically eight and four or nine and three. Is that expectation wise? Is that in the ballpark? Yeah. You know, I think that that's fair. I think for the most, most people here, kind of view that as a bit low. I think nine and a half, I think if you put it at nine and a half, I think a lot of people would be a little bit more comfortable with that. There's a lot of confidence, you know, within that Utah program that they're going to be able to challenge for, uh, you know, the Pac-12 championship. And so to have 
you know, an eight and a half mark uh, seems a bit low for a championship contender maybe, but I, I honestly think that that's fair with, you know, with what Utah brings back, some of the question marks, you know, still to be answered at quarterback. There's a lot of optimism about Charlie Brewer, who we'll talk about a lot here, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, but still, those, those things have to be answered. And so, you know, for the most part, I think eight and a half is, is a pretty fair line. So uh, let, let's go ahead and talk about the quarterback position then, because we, we, we spoke about, about Jake Bentley. Cam Rising got hurt last year. Utah brings in two quarterbacks. I, I'm assuming because you named him that Brewer is going to be the, the, the likely starter for the fall. For those who don't remember, good player at Baylor in 2019. Mm-hmm. Not incredible, but like Baylor had a great year as a team. Last year, the numbers were pretty pedestrian, but as we've talked about on Cover 3 a couple times, Dave Aranda's offense and what he allowed them to do was maybe not uh, maybe not great. And Baylor had a whole lot of COVID issues too as far as opponents canceling on them because they kept right. uh, testing positive. So not a lot of rhythm maybe for Brewer last year. What, what are you expecting out of this quarterback position? Yeah, this is going to be the storyline of, of fall camp for the next couple of months as we prepare for the 2021 season. This is going to be a, a quarterback battle between Charlie Brewer and Cameron Rising, who was expected to return, you know, from his injury that he suffered in that USC game last season. And, you know, for the most part, the expectation is that Charlie Brewer is considered the favorite going into fall camp. You know, there's like you mentioned with with his 2020 season at Baylor, there's a lot of context to take into account when evaluating him that season. But if you go back to to the 2019 season, I think you get a better idea of what Brewer can be um, when he's got talent around him, when he's got a team around him, a very good team around him. And I think that's how Utah is viewing him uh, because if you go back to that 2019, 2019 season, it was Baylor and Utah coming down the stretch in November for that final college football playoff spot. Oklahoma was in there as well. Uh, but those two teams, you know, Tyler Huntley, uh, kind of similar to Charlie Brewer in a sense where similar career path had a mediocre to decent first two years as a starter. And then really that senior season, that 2019, 2019 season is where, you know, Huntley himself kind of took a step forward under Andy Ludwig. And, and the feeling is, and, and what the talk has been since Charlie Brewer has been here is that Charlie Brewer and Andy Ludwig have really meshed well together. And when you talk about important things on offense, that marriage between an offensive coordinator and quarterback can be extremely valuable in terms of just understanding, picking up the offense, picking up what offensive coordinators want from their quarterback in terms of execution. And Charlie Brewer has been, you know, just a a great marriage there for, for Andy Ludwig. So from that aspect, there's a lot of optimism in Charlie Brewer winning the job this season. And, you know, Utah's done a a great job to surround him with some pieces to better compete and to, to add to the passing attack this year. So let's talk about some of those pieces. I'm I'm interested. I'm looking at the transfer portal here. I'm sure we'll talk recruits as well in a second, but man, I, I grew up in Fort Myers. Chris Curry is from Lehigh, which is right next door. I went to his high school practices. You know, I, I've seen TJ Pleasure in person. They they got some, like, thick dudes now at the running back. Because these guys are not – like, they're listed 190, 200. You, you think that's uh, – I don't know. Last time I saw those guys, I think they're a little bit thicker than, than that. Utah's going back to the Thunder run game here? Man, we, we might see it. I tell you what, uh, I tell you what, man, it's uh, they've loaded up at running back and, and, you know, it, it was important for them to, to do that. Um, you know, as, as mentioned, Ty Jordan emerged as an all American player with his unfortunate passing Utah had to address the running back position. And, and they did so pretty emphatically with TJ Pledger and Chris Curry in the transfer portal after the, after the season and, you know, these are guys where I think Utah is viewing them as, you know, tremendous talents that, you know, maybe just didn't get, didn't find the right opportunity, you know, at their previous programs at Oklahoma and at LSU. Both of them have, have you know, received rave reviews for what they bring to the program in terms of the day in and day out process, you know, coming to practice, competing in those types of things. So that's always something that Utah values when they evaluate kids and evaluate transfers. And, 
you know, they, and then, you know, just last month, they added another running back to the mix and Tavion Thomas, who was another, you know, big recruit. He's 6'2", 225. He was in that 2018 or it was 2018 or 2019. I can't remember uh, exactly what it was. I believe it was the 2018 class. He was committed to Oklahoma for almost a year, uh, started to flirt with Ohio State there in, in January leading up to the February signing day, ultimately ends up at, at Cincinnati, plays his freshman year there, 500 yards. He's another guy that Utah's brought in from the JUCO ranks to that mix. And so you look at those three guys with Pledger, Curry, and, and Thomas, and yeah, you're right. Utah's added some, some dudes, some, some thick dudes to that running back mix. You know, the running game is always going to be Utah's calling card on offense. They're always going to rely on, on the running game. And they've added some good weapons and some versatile and, and complementary pieces here. You know, you got TJ Pledger, who's more of that scat back. You've got Curry, who's kind of that violent, punishing type of runner. And then you've got Thomas, who's, you know, for as big as he is, he's pretty agile and moves very well for his size. So, you know, and then you've got, you've still got a talented young freshman, a third year freshman with this COVID thing. Uh, in in Mackay Bernard, who is, you know, with that time in the program, there's a lot of confidence in his ability as well. So, you know, Utah is pretty well stacked at running back. And, you know, it's it's really going to be fascinating to see who merge, who emerges as the starter. All right. Now we got to shift a little bit because I, I I'm looking at my sheet here. It's got kind of where they did well, where they were poor last year. And this is just screaming. Uh issues and it's kind of remarkable that that they had a a the number 30 sp plus ranked offense last year which is of course opponent adjusted and whatnot given some of these issues they had obviously losing losing you know cam early at the QB position is one but steve they were now remember three teams didn't play college football last year so there were only 127 teams in the nation right because new mexico connecticut and somebody old dominion i think didn't play they were 127th in passes to receivers yeah. that were not in, in the slot. Like only 15% of their balls went to outside receivers. That is literally dead last in the nation. And it's not even half of the national average. Like the national average is 36. Right. Utah's at 15. Like if you – God, if you kept the safety deep or anything against Utah last year, that was basically coaching malpractice. You could just play zero coverage and si single those guys up after a couple of games of seeing what they were going to do, like the ball was not going to go to the outside receivers. And it, it felt to me like they also, like they went into a shell, like they, they played very, very slow. Not that they're ever like a crazy up-tempo team, but like they were 115th in adjusted pace last year, which accounts for you know how often you run and pass too. And then I thought they allowed like more tackles for loss than normal, maybe because teams were able to blitz them so effectively because they were not scared of those receivers and, and the, the threat of the home run via the pass game uh i mean not to go crazy stat guy here but they were i mean they were also not surprisingly 111th in passing explosiveness so i know that part of that's on the quarterback but that also makes me kind of a little skeptical on these receivers what, what what are we expecting this year yeah you know that's uh, <laughs> that is I, I think i referenced this earlier where you know utah learned a lot about themselves and it'll be interesting to see what that what that means in 2021 and the, and the talks throughout the offseason has been that we've got to be better in the passing game and you know those are great stats that you referenced but and and you know a lot when you go back and you actually watch the tape a lot of it is execution right um, just Jake Bentley, again, a lot of context with him and, and just last year, not getting the time, not getting the reps to fully, uh, assimilate within the, the offense. And, you know, that, that, that was very apparent. Utah has some talented receivers. They had talented receivers last year. Brian Thompson, you know, has been one of the, the, the more productive receivers previously over the, the previous two years in 2019 and 2018, Jalen Dixon, uh, he didn't play last year. He was he was a kid that was uh, a vertical threat that they didn't have. He was held out because of you know COVID protocols um, for the season. Brent Keithy was a guy that you know Utah really tried to emphasize in the passing game. And if you watch, there was one game in particular. Uh, Jake Bentley had Brent Keithy in the end zone open three times, and just because of poor passes. Past the pass rush affecting the play, missed 
Brant Keithy for, for some easy scores. And, and so, you know, a lot of this is just Utah realizing that they need to be better. They need to be more efficient. And you've seen it this off season with what they've done in terms of, you know, bringing in transfers, you, you're talk, we're talking about Charlie Brewer, but they also brought in Jaquinda Jackson and forced our quarterback, Peter Costello. So you bring in three quarterbacks in a cycle, you know, you're, you're making a statement there that you want to be better there. You want to have better depth. You bring back Cameron rising from injury. You know, that's, that's a pretty good stable of quarterbacks. Then, you know, you looking at the receiver position, you go into the portal and you bring in Theo Howard, who, you know, he didn't have a great 2020 season at Oklahoma. He got injured earlier in the year, pretty significant injury. And, and the fact that he played last year was, was pretty more remarkable, but you go back to his time at UCLA, very productive player and the type of player that Utah needs, uh, you know, a guy with the know-how, uh, the, the savviness in terms of his route running and ability to compete against, you know, number one cornerbacks in the Pac-12, that's a big deal for this Utah passing game. So he's an experienced guy. He's been through it. And then, you know, you add a, 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 a talented piece. You know, he doesn't have the experience, doesn't have the production to his name, but Maneer McLean is a name to keep in mind. From SC, six right? foot four. Yeah, yeah, from SC, six foot four, 210 pounds. You know, his first couple of months at USC, he was he was the talk of the town amongst a, a wide receiver corpse that included, you know, what we know now to be Drake London, uh, uh, Amon Ross, St. Brown, some really talented players in that group. And Neil McClain was, was talked about as one of the better options in, in the receiving class, uh, in that receiving group, you know, in fall camp. So, you know, it's, it, there's a, a, a bit of a high risk, high reward with, with McClain, but, you know, he fits that position that Utah's looking to address much better than what they had in that role previously. So, you know, you're looking at it, you're, you're trying to improve the quarterback position. You bring in some pieces to improve the outside skill positions as well. Uh, and, you know, there's, you're, you're making a pretty clear statement that you want to be better in the passing game and you want to get the ball to those outside receivers. Offensive line. Are you, uh, are you concerned? Pretty, pretty confident. What, what What's the thought there? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Utah is an offensive line that traditionally starts slow and gets going by the end of the year. Uh, you know, I don't know that they can afford to do that this year with, you know, you've got Washington state, your first game in the conference, then you, then you play, you've got a buy, but then you've got, you know, USC and ASU back to back weeks. Those that's where we're going to learn a lot about this offensive line and the progress that they've made from last year to this year. It's, you know, this is a group that's been together now for three years. They return basically everybody um, from the previous two years. So there's a lot of experience. It's a group that's grown together. There's still some things to be sorted out. Um, you know, there's a lot of depth on the interior line at those two guard spots, but they've they figured out their guys, you know, at center, at left tackle and at right tackle. And so it's just kind of sorting out who fits best, where finding your best five um, but there's, there's reason to be optimistic about better and improved play from the offensive line this season for Utah. Now, defensively, this is the Kyle Whittingham teams are almost always great defensively. If not great, then, then pretty good mm -hmm. last year, like game one. Okay. They had some issues. Obviously some of that was also offensive related, putting the defense in some kind of sketchy spots, right? Uh, still ended up with, I think like a top 25 ish is defense. I don't know how much you want to you know, talk stats from last year in a, a five game sample set. Everything on my screen looks good. The one thing that kind of caught my eye here, uh, did Utah just like give up a surprising number of home runs like in the run game and in the play action game on early downs? Cause it looks like if they got an opponent, they're passing downs. It was night, night termite, but like they, those are kind of two areas I'm just curious about. Yeah, you know, so Utah had, uh, they had to replace an entire secondary from 2019, you know, that, and that was a very talented 2019 secondary. I think all five starters have been in the NFL, Jalen Johnson, Julian Blackman, Terrell Burgess, you know, are, are the three main guys to talk about, but, you know, so, so Utah had to, had to replace all five secondary players and Utah is known for playing, you know, man coverage in that secondary press man coverage. They had to play a lot of zone last year. It was different for them, but they had to protect that secondary 
you know, a young secondary, especially in those first couple of games where you're going up against, you know, USC with that receiving court, Keaton Slovis, um, you know, they, it was, it was a slow, slow process for this secondary, a slow learning process. They had to keep things in front of them. And that was kind of the, the issue last year was they weren't who they were, who they traditionally are. And that's a press man team where they try to force things, you know, over the top. If you're going to beat us, you're going to beat us over the top and just out executing us. Right. Uh, but they had to play zone. They had to give that up a little bit. And, you know, that changes a lot of, of who you are and, and where you're, where you're giving up basically opportunities for the offense to, to exploit. Right. So um, they're going to get back to more of that press man identity, more of that man coverage, because, you know, they've got some talent in the secondary that has some experience. Now they got their feet wet last year and, you know, they also, they're looking to be a little bit more aggressive with their front four and, and, generating more pressure and, and and with those front guys you know they they've got some talented linebackers that are going to be all over the place uh but they want to be aggressive with that defensive line as well so um so yeah you know it was it was a difficult year last year for the secondary just because they had to kind of protect themselves a little bit play some softer coverages and just keep things in front of them but but utah is going to to be a bit more aggressive this season and so yeah those numbers should look a little different this year i'm thinking bud Steve, uh, I don't know if you, if you knew the exact percentage on this, but when, when, while you were, you were talking, I pulled this up. And they were 119th in percentage of man coverage played. They only, they only yeah. ran they only ran man. I mean, according to you know our, our stats portal at CBS, 16 percent of the time. Right. That that's pretty yeah. shocking for a Utah football team. Uh, who are like I know most of these Pac-12 teams are bringing back pretty much everybody. Is there a name that 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 they lost that they're going to have difficulty replacing or that there's, is there a player on defense that we know uh, that by the way, we are in overtime. I, I figured this conversation would, would last more than 15 minutes. Sorry, bud. I, I, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's fine. Man. <laughs> um, is there a name we need to know on the defensive side of the football that could be like the next Utah star that, that like nationally people don't know about, or who's going to be counted on to step up to replace somebody who's left? You know, a, a guy that, that hasn't really received a lot of pub that I'm, I'm, optimistic about is Mika Tafua. He's a defensive end. He's, and the thing is, is like, he's been the starter for three years, but he's played a complimentary type of role to the other defensive end that Utah's had Bradley and I, who was kind of the, he's the all-time sack leader. I'm looking at Mika Tafua as a guy to kind of emerge as, you know, that, that playmaking defensive end that they've had over the years. Um, you know, he made some key plays in 2020, uh, didn't have the sack numbers, but he was able to generate pressures, make some plays, you know, some batted passes at the line of scrimmage in, in key situations, third downs, fourth downs, those types of things. And I'm thinking Mika Tafua, you know, he's, he's returned to the program in the best shape that he's ever been. And, you know, I think he's going to be a guy to, to keep an eye on as a, as a dark horse kind of emerging type of a star type player. Awesome. Uh might have taken a little of that plus 400, plus 450 for the South yesterday morning. Uh, we're recording this on the 17th. Uh, yesterday morning was the 16th. So, uh, unfortunately, that it, it, that's off the board now uh, after it <laughs> looks like some programs maybe allegedly uh, had uh, visitors. Uh, did, did, did Utah get any visitors <laughs> here? Where did it go? <laughs> No, nah, man, like oh, this, man. that I, whole thing, this whole thing is crazy, man. And I can't believe what's going on. This is crazy. Yeah, that was uh, that, that was that was certainly interesting, but that could shake up the South. I mean, like I, it really could. I'm, I'm waiting to do the Arizona State episode until after July one because we have no idea that July one. For those who don't know at home, that's the date that you have to jump into the portal if you want to be eligible for the fall. So Man. we don't know how things are going to shake up. It it certainly sounds like like uh, you you count Utah out of the South at your own risk. Um, by the way, what's your Twitter handle? We need we, we, we pub uzo.com. We need to pub the Twitter handle. Oh man, just pretty simple. S Bartle. That's S B A R T L E two four seven. The guy on the big rubber ducky. Um, that's that's me, man. You, you follow at your own risk, basically. Awesome. All right, follow Steve, follow Steve on, on Twitter. Hit up youthzone.com if you guys enjoyed the conversation. Happen to be a Utah fan? Maybe you never visited. Somehow go over there, become a VIP subscriber. Awesome message board experience. Great insider info. Great conversation and and, and awesome reporting. So. Steve, thanks so much. Bud, man, thank you so much, man. Appreciate you guys. Enjoyed it.